Hey, everybody, this is Jeff Speakman, and you are here with Awaken Nation and Brad Zollis. A huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up, tired of the way things used to be. They are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zollis, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers. The disruptors and the game changers. Everyday people, just like you and me, from all over, who are doing amazing things. Hey, everybody. I have a great guest on today. I've been trying to get on for a while. I've been an admirer of his uh, for many, many years. And that is Mr. Jeff Speakman, or shall I say, O Sensei, Mr. Speakman? <laughs> you can call me Jeff. It's okay. <laughs> You might know him from The Perfect Weapon, uh, which I love. Was, went to the theater by myself because my friends didn't want to go. Uh, also, uh, Black Belt in several disciplines, which we're going to talk about. But the reason I really wanted him on the show is Kempo, which I have a background in. And uh, really want to talk about mastership. And of course, you're all over the world, Jeff. So welcome to yes. Awakened Nation. Thank you so much. Really Really appreciate the invitation. I'm excited about this. So let's dig in. You and Jason Statham have something in common, and that is diving. Uh, let's talk about how you did that, because your career actually started out diving, and you did not have a coach. How in the heck did you do right. that? Um, that's a really good question. I'm not sure what the real answer is. We just shut up and went to work and did it. The thing that makes it even more sort of confounding is you know, we're talking about Chicago, Illinois, and in the winter, and our high school did not have a swimming pool. <laughs> so we had to go to the neighboring high school's pool before school opened every single morning. So it's 5.30, 6 o'clock, you're outside and two feet of snow waiting for the bus to pick you up to go to a pool to put on a swimsuit. And, you know, if you're a swimmer, once you're in the water, you get warmed up, you're okay. When you're a springboard diver, you're in and out and in and out all the time. So it was even more challenging. But, um, <clears throat> you know, we just shut up and did it and because uh, we wanted to. And we were a very close group of friends. And it really turned out to be, um, I think, probably the most important thing which promoted moving forward and achieving different successes in my life because the work ethic that you had to employ to get your butt out of bed at 5 30 in the morning in the winters of chicago to go to a pool uh, built some sort of mechanism inside me that mm -hmm. um just made me go forward with whatever whatever i had a passion for well we've all watched those movies of the uh the shaolin monks in china having to trudge through snow and ice to yes, train yes. I, I i think you got a modern version of that um, yeah right so it's right. pretty exciting i also want to give a shout out before we move it, uh, any further forward to my dentist who is also your dentist dr jim wright and his wonderful yes. wife debbie wright um they introduced me to yeah they are they introduced wonderful. me to you we have the same values and of course the same uh talks debbie and i love to talk for hours like be, before my appointment if i show up an hour before i'm at her desk okay and we just talk <laughs> yeah uh, uh, but it's exciting uh <clears throat> to know that you're six degrees of separation away from one person or the other <laughs> right. i know so let's uh you know your martial arts career how did it start because you didn't get Kempo right away it was a japanese art uh am i correct on that yeah yes you're exactly right it was right after I left Chicago and went to Southern Missouri to go to the then college, now university there in Joplin, Missouri, because a friend I graduated from high school with, their family bought a small ranch south of Joplin, and they invited me to come and stay with them and go to school. And uh, I was working in a shipping warehouse in downtown Chicago, and which was actually a lot of fun. I love the city of Chicago. It's an incredibly dynamic, diverse place. <clears throat> but it was time to move on and try to create a life for myself. So went down there. Uh, the deal was I got up every morning to feed the cattle before I went to school. So at 530, I was out there <laughs> dragging <laughs> buckets of feed out. 
And um, that paid for my room and board for my first year there in southern Missouri. Then I moved into the town of Joplin, got a job. And then it took six years to get a four-year degree because I had to keep taking time off to work yeah. and earn money to pay for tuition. But at the end of six years, I took my degree and I didn't have any debt because I, I worked my way through instead of getting loans and et cetera. Wait a minute. That sounds like boomer stuff right there. You work hard. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Don't get loans. You work hard. Yeah. Uh, you and I have a bit in common because I grew up in a small town in uh, Pennsylvania, but uh, you know, th those work ethics, you know, I had to be up at five 30 and, you know, uh, my dad was Hungarian. And so he didn't, he, I didn't have, you know, a helmet when I rode bicycle or any of those things. <laughs> You had to you had to work, you know, and people don't realize that. Uh, I remember coming home from Hershey Park after a ten hour shift. You know, I was like seventeen, eighteen, and he goes, "Put your work clothes on." And we went out back and dug a ditch for four hours. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, be... I think it's a very salient point uh, to be able to say there's an there's an awful lot to be said for the general idea of working for what you have yeah as opposed to you know having it given to you or inheriting it or some you know program where it's gifted to you right i think this is a huge huge mistake of parenting in the last couple of decades where it's the entitlement that the kids feel because even if you have the financial stability to be able to get your kid a new bmw mm -hmm. when he's 18 uh yeah. don't do it you know unless he works for it or she and and produces something that contributes to their enjoyment of that part of their life they have to have that sense of work earn achieve and if we lose that then then we're in trouble i agree wholeheartedly with you and i i really want to do a deep dive into this next generation um yes. because uh, you know i kind of do that kind of i do that work for corporations uh and um I found that to be very true. The ones that have gone through martial arts or scouting, they know their place. They know they have yes. to earn it. Um, and uh, I'm glad, you know, it's refreshing to hear you talk about that. Um, but you. let's get back to your first sensei teaching you. When did you know you liked the martial arts? Well, um, you know, we just spoke about growing up in Chicago and being a springboard yeah. diver, as you brought up. So, when I left at 17, I did not have a good home life. So the opportunity to go live on a small ranch and, and uh, in Missouri and get the heck out of my house, uh, I jumped on that. At age 17, I moved to uh, Joplin, Missouri to attend Missouri Southern State, as I mentioned, then college, now university. You know, coming from a background of growing up from the time you're six years old, springboard diving in the summer, gymnastics in the winter, uh, you, of course, I was going to go on to something else, athletic, because that's what my entire life was. And it brought me a tremendous amount of happiness. So I was either going to go into like a professional dance or into martial arts, something movement related. And back then, I'm sure you remember the great, great TV series Kung Fu yes. with David Carradine, which was supposed to be Bruce Lee, by the way. Yes. But um, um, I was such a fan of that. Because it started to, or it furthered my innate curiosity about life and wisdom and intellect and digging deeper and learning more about the world, just with those flashbacks, you know, of going back to the temple. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so I decided to produce uh, um, something along that line. And here's, here's the interesting story. So I was a roommate with a guy for an entire year. Until I found out just through conversation that he was a black belt in Japanese Goju. And I th the first thing I thought of, how interesting that yeah. this guy did all of that work and all of that stuff and achieved that level and didn't even talk about it or boast about it or show it off at all whatsoever. So, mm -hmm. of course, that intrigued me even more because it seemed to have a genuineness about it. Right. So um, he actually was the first one that started to teach me. Go Giroux, and then after a year of that, I went to uh, become a personal student of his instructor, which is a gentleman named Lou Angel, who just passed a couple of years ago. 
And ironically, in 1963, and think about that for a second, he was really only the second Caucasian or white guy to be in Japan studying directly from Gogen Yamaguchi, the 10th degree black belt of the Japanese karate at that time. So you can imagine what it was like for him to be in that environment, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so in 1963, he tested for his third degree black belt and then came back to the Midwest and then proliferated Japanese Gojiru. And he was currently retired and he was the night sergeant of a small city outside of Joplin, which was known for trouble. And so whenever there was trouble, they always sent Lou Angel out <laughs> on the street to take care of business, which he did uh, very effectively. So I met him and he started to teach me, this is the really cool part, in the abandoned basement jail cell of the Webb City Police Department. Oh, 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 oh. Wow. <laughs> Can you imagine? Abandoned, right? Yeah, and concrete so, floors. Concrete <laughs> floors, walls, one string hanging from the ceiling with one light bulb on it. You know, and the, and the creak of the iron doors that would open, we would step into the cell for a lesson, which is where he had his bags hanging up and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So after training with him for quite a while, uh, then he came out of retirement, opened the Academy of Self-Defense, where I continued to study and eventually teach. You know, I have this image from the perfect weapon that that's how you got trained. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just blew my mind. So your whole life is like a Shaolin priest, you know, a yeah. monk learning, you yeah. know, the, it's, the hard it's way. Really the karate yeah. kid, you know, in, yeah. incarnate. Yeah. Uh, I love that you tell the story. And for those of you who are unaware of history, you know, back in, in the day, you know, Bruce Lee, a lot of people believe he he was assassinated because he taught uh, a Chinese man taught white people these ancient arts and he was blackballed in the community. Yes, he was. So, so sure. for Lou Angel to teach you, uh, I'm sure he was, uh, uh, you know, this Caucasian man who learned in Japan had respect for the Japanese people. You don't just pick up this art because you feel like it. Um, right. Wanted to train, wanted to learn how to fight. And then he comes over here uh, for those of you who may not be martial artists, uh, senseis and and uh, masters are always being challenged in their own dojo. You know, someone will come in and just say, you're not worthy, and they they try to pick a fight with you. So this this person was, was being trained the hard way in real life fighting instead of just dojo work. So, uh, uh, you know, I want to get back to you, but uh, I like to, you know, my audience, sometimes I, I want to let them know certain things. So I hope. They appreciate that. Uh, so let, let's go forward. Now, what happened? I mean, am I skipping ahead if I say, well, how did Hollywood come calling? Uh, is that correct? How did that happen? Yes, a, a bit of a background there. So uh, in 1978, I began my journey in Japanese Gojuru. I graduated from school in 1983. And my instructor then, Lou Angel, said, you know, if you want to make martial arts your life, you should move to California and study Kempo from Ed Parker because he really is the best in the world uh, at that time. <clears throat> so, of course, I knew the name Ed Parker and I knew there was a thing called Kempo Karate, but I didn't even know what it was. But I thought, how extraordinary. And I, and I really want to lay this out right because this is a super important point. When you're, as you touched on a moment ago, when you're especially in the traditional martial arts and Japanese Gojuru would be as traditional as any, you would never, <clears throat> they don't even allow you to go study the same art in another person's school who was even that instructor might even be from the same dojo, the same studio, the same system. That's how close they are. So to have somebody of Lou Angel's stature <clears throat> go to one of his closest black belts at that time and say, you know, don't go to Japan, you know, like as opposed to go to San Francisco, which is where Yamaguchi's son was living. And, and you would normally think, OK, if you want to move up, go to there and study from them. <clears throat> but he didn't. Not only did he send me to somebody else, but he sent me to a person who is the opposite of traditional martial arts. Right. So that's even more extraordinary. So <clears throat> what that told me was that Lou Angel was more interested in what was the best for Jeff Speakman as opposed to what was the best for Lou Angel. 
And that's the really important message here that I think now in this time, we confuse <clears throat> this UFC MMA thing with martial arts. Right. MMA, in my opinion, which stands for mixed martial art, should be MMF, mixed martial fighting. Because there, there really isn't anything artistic in their, uh, in their playbook. In other words, the, the goal for you in MMA is to cause <clears throat> one person to fall from position for you to gain. Right. And in the martial art world, you would choose to fall yourself, to give up, to surrender, to help someone else to have a better life. You see the inverse relationship there. Right. So we do need and do have a robust competition system in Kempo 5.0, which is the art that I do. <clears throat> but we uh, still are a part of and want to be a part of a bigger focus of what it is to be human and, and what it is to be an artist in the martial way. And, and that explain, that duality, which, yes, it does have a lot of overlap, um, really does lend itself to the, the, the duality, the polarity of where we are in life right now. So there are so many people that are out for their own personal gain, whether it be religious or political or some other insecurity, as opposed to the benefit of all. Right. So would you sacrifice something of yourself just to help one other person to have a better life? And if we could shift our focus from this digression that we live in now of capitalism and whatever you would loosely call democracy, yeah. uh, greatly under threat at the moment, if, if you would shift your focus from I'm right and you're wrong and I'm going to take my piece even if I have to take it from you to all life is one and let's figure out a way that we can help each other and live together and make this world a better place. That that's really the message of the martial arts. And that's where I come from and everything I do in my life. That's profound. And I completely agree with you because there was a time when the sensei <coughs> served the students, you know, the sensei was, you know, there to make sure you knew how to fight, not to worship the master. Um, and I have to give a big shout out to my senseis and masters. They call them professors now, but uh, yeah. Master Charles Raymond and uh, Master Anthony Snowball, uh, who trained me. And their, their theory was this. The martial arts must adjust to modern fighting styles. So the only reason they went from Shaolin Kempo to Kempo Jiu-Jitsu was because they wanted to be able to adapt to a new fighting style. Uh, that was coming along and more exactly. people were getting trained by the way, you know, when you and I were growing up, um, very few people knew martial arts. So you could pretty much win a fight if you were just trained a little bit better, <laughs> you know, yeah. today yeah. that big, tall six foot four guy <laughs> might be the head guy at his dojo. You know, he's training, but in the past, big guys never trained. Now they do. Right. Uh, so I, Hey, I want to ask you, what was it like to work with Ed Parker? Because he is a legend, as we all know. And there's a great yes. picture of you guys in Poe's position. Um, and, and I just love that. Um, but, you know, my black belt is in Kempo as well, Kempo Jiu Jitsu. I really am curious what it was like to work with the master of this art. Um, that's a great <clears throat> question. Thank you for it, because it is really, really, really important. Um, I knew him. And, and I knew him well. You know, I went to his house every week for three and a half years as a student at Kempo. And then I got the job as the perfect weapon, uh, as the lead in the perfect weapon movie for Paramount. Uh, so I went over there all the time. We choreographed the fight scenes together. More than that, he was on the movie set with me every single day. There was a fight scene. Wow. And if it was, you know, four o'clock in the morning, he was standing right there. <clears throat> we would finish a take. I'd go sit down, he'd put my jacket on my shoulders, hand me my bottle of water, and then make some corrections. You know, my, my hand was down instead of up or something like that. So we did this every step of the way together. So my point of sharing all that is to kind of 
lay out to you how close I was to him. I cared for him deeply. I knew he cared for me deeply because we told each other that. And by going through that process of choreographing and thinking of the fight scenes for the perfect weapon, I really got to learn more of how he thought. And that's really the important thing because I refer to Ed Parker as the Einstein of martial arts. Here's a guy, and let me define that. <clears throat> you can take a bunch of really smart people and they're all looking at the same thing. But one person sees something different than the others. And that's what makes that person a genius. When you can look at the same thing everybody else is looking at, but you see something different. And that's exactly who he was. So he took ancient Chinese fighting techniques, Americanized them by bringing in the cause and effect relationships of physics and principles and concepts and geometry, made that be the focal point of whatever technique you're working on, and therefore created the science of self-defense, which is the term he used quite often. We have taken that and gone further down that road, employed physics and principles and cause and effect relationships to a much greater extent, because I think that is the direction he was heading. And that allowed me to be able to take Kempo into an environment that it was completely ignorant of, which is how to do your Kempo on the ground. And that is no small bag of tricks to try to create a solution for that, because there was none. Yeah. Uh, and it took many years, and I worked with all of my students, and we were able to do that. But my point is, the only reason we were able to do that is because I was touched by the hands of a master. And in that process, he taught me how to think and create solutions based on science and logic and physics and principle. One of my senseis actually asked me to ask you this question. What is the difference in when you started training in martial arts with the young people today in martial arts? And you know, you touched on some of it right now, but I think martial arts kids have a different attitude once they train and get that first belt. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a very, very accurate microcosm of the much bigger problem. When, look, once again, let me speak about my art of Kempo so that I'm you know, in my lane, <laughs> as they say. Um, as things have changed, and really the betterment, in my opinion, of what the Gracie family did in 91 when they came here with their brand of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, followed by the Machado family, and that gave birth to this thing that morphed into what you and I call MMA. <clears throat> what they did, really, we are, the, the, the kind of Kempo I teach, which is called Kempo 5.0, re representing the fifth evolution of Kempo. That's where the name came from. Um, uh, but we wanted to get away from Kempo Karate because the, the leadership of, of Kempo Karate was going nowhere quick. And we were doing this deep dive because we didn't have a solution to how to do your Kempo on the ground. And the bizarre thing here is the quotes directly from Ed Parker, the guy that brought Kempo here to the United States and was this famous guy we've talked about, Bruce Lee's teacher, Elvis Presley's teacher, opened the first commercial karate school in the United States. I mean, this guy, you know, had a presence like no other. Um, and, and he brought in this thinking model of how to create solutions to the, our ailments, the things that bother us. When he left in, in 1990, December of 90, right after we were done filming The Perfect Weapon, he didn't even get to see the movie. Oh. So, yeah, it was just so tragic. But when, when he died, there was a leadership vacuum that would be difficult to put into words. And, and then it became the Wild West again, everybody out for themselves. And missing the point, which is the great leadership that Ed Parker brought us, he also taught us how to lead. Mm -hmm. One of his famous quotes is, when I'm gone, I hope no one traditionalizes my art. Well, everybody has. <laughs> you know, <laughs> There are like three or four people, I'm one of them, who, who hasn't done that. And now, you know, 35 plus years after his death, I go around to these places, and by the way, I'm not welcome anymore in any other Kempo schools. 
Um, I'm not invited to teach seminars, to sit on testing boards because they've watered everything down just to make money yeah. to live up. Now, it's not that I don't understand that. They don't have health care. They don't have uh, retirement accounts. They don't have anything. And this is what they're stuck with. So I understand why they're doing it. But in the process of doing it, you're tearing down the foundations of what this amazing, wonderful art is. Yeah. We're having the wrong conversation all over the world and all over this country about everything because it's being steered by those who are unremarkable in their lives. They are in leadership positions and they should not be. They don't deserve to be there. I am astounded that you said that because I think that's what I've started to observe. My senseis, they started with a much bigger uh, school system and they walked away because that guy was handing out black belts to people who watched videos, did the katas, and then got their belts. Yeah, I mean, how the hell can you do that? I mean, I, I and I hate watching the Karate Kid because I know <clears throat> what it takes to get a black belt. You know, you know, yeah. it doesn't take a summer. Okay, <laughs> washing <laughs> cars drives me nuts. But I, I like the fact that you talked about Ed Parker this way because he was he was a tough dude and he was humble you know he kind of stayed in the background if you mention ed parker to maybe nine out of ten martial artists they might go oh yeah he, he him and bruce lee fought you know but they don't even know his art maybe what i loved about kempo is the logic and the science behind the way it works but um i want to i want to show one of your instructional videos if i may here here it is uh jeff sensei jeff speakman in action roll the tape Paramount Pictures presents international Kenpo star, Jeff Speakman. When you look into the abyss of you not being here, did you do something that mattered? Did you contribute to the common good in a very meaningful way? That's the drive that I have. way forward for us all is through the balance of wisdom, strength, and kindness. And then he winds up right there. And that's when I go, boom, yes! Hit him with a forearm, stand him up. Now, I'll either gonna hit him under the chin, put your head down, I'm gonna hit him right on the nose, or with his head up, I'm gonna hit him in the trachea. Any of that is gonna stand him up. So, but I stayed in my reverse bow. So when I was here and hit, I opened my hand. You can see, if you guys can come around. Let's open up a little bit. <clears throat> I turned my hand and opened it. My elbow bent. And now this is called contouring. So I'm contouring up his body, and then I go pop. And I straighten that, bang, and that stands him up. That lifts his head and stands him up, which gives me the opportunity to do an angle switch. <laughs> now look at all the drive I've got on that elbow coming back. Now I'm on the other side, and that drove him back. Okay, so that's your move to finish the technique. Hey, this is what I loved about Kempo and still do. It's just, to me, uh, it's a beautiful art. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what Kempo kind of is and how it works, um, it's multiple strikes, super fast, using wrist, elbows, sometimes a hammer, you know, fist, uh, things like that. Rarely the direct fist punch. Uh, low kicks, we're king of the low kicks. Um, if you ever want to get into a, a fight in a phone booth, Kempo is what you want to know because the other <laughs> martial arts exactly are right. Do, 
It's exactly. close combat, <laughs> close quarter fighting. You get close yes. and you destroy. Uh, and that's what I loved about it, Jeff, is this whole, the logic of how the body works. And you can take down a bigger man just with technique, technique, technique. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, let's talk about that a little bit because that's where my love of martial arts um, began. And I didn't start training until I was 45 and got my black belt after 10 belt tests, uh, two, three broken ribs, in two in tournament, one in training, <laughs> broken toe, knocked out once. Um, and I finally got my black belt after five years of training. What I loved was the logic in the way you could fight. It, yeah. it approached fighting as a science. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think that's so well said. Um, and I love the fact that you... Uh, use the phrase you just did, which I use have for 35 years, which is the the worst place to fight a Kempo guy is in a phone booth. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the other thing, most martial arts, in fact, the most popular ones have these really high kicks and they're yeah. uh, so famous for the jump spin kick and the blah, blah, blah. Um, and we don't do that in Kempo. So the question has often come to me, do you kick people in the head? In Kempo, I said, yes, absolutely. Once I knock you to the ground, I'll kick you in the head. <laughs> and and that's really what it is. When you bring the target down to the natural range of that weapon, that's when you use that weapon. Yeah. When you take the weapon out of its natural range, there are inherent risks in doing that, where you put yourself in jeopardy. Now, that wasn't such a big deal 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but it is now because everybody and their dog knows how to do to some reasonable degree a type of MMA style fighting. You know, they know how to take you down. And once you're down, if you don't know what you're doing down there, you're going to be in big trouble in about a millisecond. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we brought into Kempo was the knowledge base of once what to do once you're down there. And that's what we were just radiantly ignorant of before. Well, it's interesting. The martial arts was always... Uh... You take the guy out before he could ever take you to the ground. That was you. You stay on your feet. That was always yes. what that was always about. Um, and the other thing I loved about Kempo is I have short arms and short legs, and my nephew is really the one who got me into it because I drove him to all his belt tests when he was a kid. Sebastian Edmund, my nephew, I give a big shout out to him. Third degree black belt in Kempo Jiu Jitsu. Um, <clears throat> he also is built like me. Okay. Kempo was the art where you took your strength and used it. You know, we had plenty of well-rounded martial artists at the, at the dojo. <clears throat> but what I loved about Kempo is it doesn't matter. It, it kind of is like uh, Wing Chun, Wing Chun. When it comes to size, does not matter. You learn to work with your strengths, your body type. And yeah, we are masters of the low kick. So from the knee down, we will break something <laughs> while we're punching in the face. But right. Right. The, the beauty and the logic of that is Ed Parker must have gone through every single kata stance position to break that up into something that was, like I always like to say, Kempo, I feel, is one of the most devastating mm. art forms out there because it stops an opponent immediately. Yes. And, and I think you're exactly right. Where we wound up in trouble 20 years ago is when we didn't have an answer for what do you do once you're taken down. And as bizarre as it sounds, even today, there are very high ranking people in the art of tempo. When you ask them that question, they'll say, oh, I just won't let him take me down. Do you realize how ridiculous that statement is? I mean, yeah. it is the height of arrogance and idiotic comments wrapped into one. Yeah. It's ridiculous. All I have to do is grab your pant cuff at the ankle and pull straight up and you're on the ground. That's sure. all I have to do. That's <clears throat> a move I just revealed. Super secret move, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but 70% of fights wind up on the ground. So yeah. No, how did you great. start? How did you start to get trained in in uh, you know it's kind of called BJJ this going down and grappling? But uh, right. I know my sensei went to Matt Sarah's camp and learned. Uh, but how did you make that transition? 
it began with uh, just working with my student base. So many of them uh, grew up wrestling or then went into jujitsu or started in jujitsu or what have you. So when I made the decision to give myself permission to open the Pandora's box of evolving the art to include something that had no relationship to what we did. This was, this was, you know, the apples to the orange. It was so different. Uh, what to do once you're down that, that it was starting over for me. So I, I worked with my students. I learned from them. Then I spent four years at a wonderful uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu dojo in the northern part of the Los Angeles area, owned by a gentleman named Todd Nathanson. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I was introduced to him through a mutual friend, somebody who studied there. And he and his family who run it are just absolute incredible people, kind of first rate in their skill level. But most importantly, first rate in their desire and ability to teach you. They didn't hold anything back. They're completely open and transparent and made a very friendly environment. You can imagine in many jujitsu or MMA schools, you know, as ridiculous as it sounds, somebody would go, yeah, I broke Jeff Speakman's arm. You know, he ain't so bad. And, you know, it's all that unbelievably insecure male machismo thing. And there wasn't a lick of that in his dojo. So I was very safe, but trained very hard. And I learned so much from him. And then the, the last step of this is as we got better and we introduced Kempo 5.0 to the world in 2005, many other really, really good Kempo people who left Kempo and went into jiu-jitsu or MMA because they realized what was missing when they saw what we were doing, they came back to Kempo. Yes. And when they came back, they brought their skill level. Yeah. So there was another, a third <laughs> learning curve of those guys who came back in, brought their training and information, and we, okay, we evolved again. So in 2005, we came out with Kempo 5.0. In 2014, we came out with Kempo 5.0.2, <laughs> which is what we teach today. So it's I a continuous it. evolution as MMA is continuously evolving. We have to, to keep up with it. Uh, wow. I'm very impressed because, um, you know, I, I had an opinion about the martial arts before I went in and, um, I am lucky that I had such great senseis. Um, it was, it was an too. ego, ego less environment. Yeah. We're here to learn. Yeah. So, uh, we rotated our training partners throughout the class. So you might be working with a white belt one minute, the next minute you're working with a black belt. And I love that because, you know, you're soaking up so much information. And if you're going to work yeah. out, why not learn something valuable? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, some of your, some of your best teachers will be your white belts. Oh, I got a lot of injuries from lower belts. I'll tell you that. <laughs> and that's, that's also true, right? <laughs> that's our joke, folks, you know. I've never get, been injured by a black belt. Right. Plenty of purple belts. Very true. <laughs> Your dojo is in 20 countries, and I'm sure you see in those countries where tradition is still alive, logic and critical thinking, and uh, servitude to each other as a community, I'm sure you see that those countries are much more stable. Yes. And, you know, the last point you just made was so important and so well said. To live your life in servitude to the betterment of others. In fact, I would even quote to you that the meaningfulness of life is found in the accomplishments you make toward the common good. And in my opinion, critical thinking is the thing that is in most jeopardy in today. Because it, you, don't, you don't think critically. You just drop down the rabbit hole of whatever it is you think you want to believe find other people that agree with you, go online, and the hate is everywhere. Yeah. And the hate and all of its antecedents, like lying and deception and all of those things, which are set into play for people to gain vantage over yeah. the system or money or over people or what have you. It is the loss of the understanding of what critical thinking is that is creating so much of the hate and divisiveness 
first in our country, which is the leader of the world. And then it is no surprise that you see that same thing manifesting in other countries. Yeah. I agree with you. And what I've seen is when you want to bring a country down, just destroy the traditional values in that country, right. the ability for the people to have critical thinking. Shame has to be removed as well. Now people are proud Beautiful. of things. When I was a kid, you know, you, you should be ashamed that you even did that. You'd go to jail for it. Um, it is the continuing erosion of freedom of thought that is plaguing all of us. And what's really interesting here, uh, there's a, a guy I'm sure you know by the name of Ray Dalio, yeah. who uh, wrote this incredible book called um, Changing World Order. Mm -hmm. So he puts together the entire history of how what different denomination became powerful throughout the world, and most importantly, how it cycles. And so when you see the pattern of things cycling, you can start to project into the future. Right now, the, uh, the, the United States is so much more economically sound than China and the rest of the world. Instead of the arc coming down in China, picking it back up, it looks like we're going to bounce and continue to be the financial world power in the near future, maybe in the long term future as well. We are much, much, much better off than the rest of the world, but people don't look at it that way. They're, yes, we're paying more for certain things, but we just came out of a pandemic. You right. know? So the fact that our inflation rate is down as low as it is in the last few years is phenomenal, and it's the best in the world. And why we don't see that is a function of, once again, the hate and vitriol that comes out of people who are in the other political dimension. Yeah. And both political dimensions are the same at fault at this. They, they rely on hate and, and small snippets of speech to create this uh, angst that we live in. I think it was done intentionally because if um, you can dumb down the population. And uh, one of the people who worked for Ronald Reagan overseeing the Department of Education, Charlotte Thompson Isserbite. She wrote the book, uh, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. Hmm. After spending her time in the Department of Education, she kept coming up with solutions to make <clears throat> the kids smarter, to give them better education so they're ready for college. And all of a sudden, she everything's shot down by her, and she realizes they don't want an educated population. They want people right. dumbed down. Just you pick up the book and look at the documentary. And if people right. don't realize this, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it out to you. Jeff and I um, came through a time when you know education was education. You had to learn certain things. Today, many of the things that we had to learn in in junior high and high school, Jeff, they now make you pay for it in college. So bachelor's degree today has all these remedial <clears throat> courses that you were supposed to get in That's high right. school. Yeah. So that means your bachelor's and master's degrees are equivalent to a high school diploma from 100 years ago. Now, if you scoff at that, I'm going to point out another thing, and you're going to laugh at this, Jeff. <laughs> Many of the, the degrees that people go for now were on the job training when you and I were kids. You just yeah, went okay. to work and they taught you how to do yeah. that job. So yeah. this is how topsy-turvy <clears throat> our world has become. become. And I love this about you, Jeff, because you now have opened up Kempo for a new generation of younger student. And this is how my nephew started. He started at like, you know, 11, 12, um, being interested in the martial arts. Uh, let's talk about that because, you know, this is, this is servitude leadership or service leadership. Yes. Uh, so again, so well said, you know, <clears throat> Following the thinking of a guy like Ray Dalio, who we were speaking about a moment ago, when you start where we are, and I think I applaud you for your accurate rendition of <laughs> the place we are marinating in at the moment, um, but you look back in, and you got to freeze frame and go, where did this come from? Why is it happening? So you go back in history and you can see, as you're pointing out back into the Reagan era, and I would even be able to point out things much earlier than that. It is the intention by design to keep people to not question authority. 
And so one of the ways you can do that is just to keep them in their indentured servitude by making sure they're not smart enough to ask questions or engage in what we just spoke about a minute ago, which is critical thinking. And it's a a long, long slog. I mean, I can remember in the 80s having conversations with people about how lobbyists are changing the future of America, you know, and government is shifting over to being nothing but another big business. But I I would also suggest that uh, in that cognitive paradigm of capitalism overtaking freedom, overtaking democracy, all of the things we're talking about are actually an inevitability. There is a point where so many people take over so much control of the money and the wealth. The wealth disparity in the United States is staggering, absolutely staggering. And you must admit that that's causing a lot of strife and angst in the general population with, oh, by you and me, for example. Yeah. And and that brings us to a place where we revolt in some way or another because we know our life is going by and one day our transition will happen to the other side, whatever that may be. And this will be over. And so you sit there, I'm 66 right now and I'm going, okay, am I going to live 20? You know, I had stage four cancer 10 years ago. Oh, wow. And and that makes you look at your your mortality in a very very real sense. Wow. Wow. God bless you for getting through that. That's rough. Uh, but Thank you me. said it all. I suggest uh, if you want to, Jeff. There's another great book that I loved, uh, and it was written by the uh, late great Jerry Doyle. He used to have a talk show, uh, but he was also known for uh, being on. Um, Babylon 5 science fiction uh, oh, series, wow. but he wrote okay. an incredible, he was head of security, uh, Garibaldi. Um, have you seen my country lately? America's wake up call. I read that book and my jaw dropped. I was literally <clears> like, <throat> he lays out everything, the the craziness that's going on right now. And when you and I were younger, I mean, people weren't this vitriolic and angry just because you voted right. for Jimmy Carter, you know? <laughs> Please put on the very, very top of your to-do list next, even if it's inconvenient, to both read the book, but most importantly, watch the documentary from uh, Noam Chomsky called yeah. The Requiem for the American Dream. And the, here's one of the great contemplatives of our day, Chomsky, <laughs> who lays out exactly the history that you laid out under the guise of dumbing down, controlling the masses. And and then I ask why, what, what's the gain, you know, and the gain is control and power and money. And when that consolidates to far less than 1% of our population, uh, let me give you an example that stupefies anyone who has at least enough sense to make breakfast in the morning. How can we be as bright and powerful and dynamic as we are in the world? And we're the only developed country that doesn't offer some kind of single payer health care for everybody. And that alone will drive the tens and hundreds of millions of people here in our country nuts. Because how many people are in their job right now and they hate it and they have to stay there because that's the only way they can have health insurance? Right. The numbers are staggering. That's just one thing. So that in and of itself will create a great deal of angst. But let me throw this on the table for your further consideration. This isn't exactly news. There was a book written in 1531 by a guy named Nicola Machiavelli. Oh, I know Called well. The Prince. And the entire book is how to lie, cheat, and steal and make your way into political favor. And then once you're there, how to maintain power at all costs. It doesn't matter. And the summation of his thrust in the book is that as long as we keep people stupid and rule them in an authoritarian way, 
that they will stay in line and the money and the power and everything will shift to that person or that very, very small group of people. And that is what has been going on since 1531 and is going on today. Now, how can that be? What I'm going to throw on the table and then I'll be anxious to hear your response is it's alarming how incredibly stupid we are. And let me make the case for that. Is there one thing that is so profoundly negative and so hurtful that it transcends all ages, sex, governments, languages all around the world that you're voluntarily doing? And the answer is tobacco. How many people around the world, my mother's one of them, who died 10, 12 years early, according to the uh, autopsy doctor who I spoke to, because of her lifelong cigarette smoking. The question that is not asked, and I will put it out there now, is how can a company like the Philip Morris company still be in business today? How can they be doing this? Now, if their answer is, well, if we don't do it, somebody else will. Okay, I believe you're correct, except now you're not the person contributing to the delinquency of an adult. I rest my case. You and I remember this, you know, nine out of 10 doctors choose Paul Malls because of their smooth smoking, you know, style. I mean, how in the hell could you do this? (laughs) People, I'm going to tell you as a marketing guy, a graphic designer, you fell for marketing, not science. (laughs) Okay. And so what we're missing in America today is lobbyists for the American people. (laughs) That's what we're missing. I hate to say it. Yes. I'd like to follow up on that and say, in my opinion, uh, it isn't government. It's business. Because there isn't a government now related to what government used to mean to you and me in 1960. For you know, yeah. it just isn't there because it's morphed into this thing where lobbyists came in and you know, it's all behind closed doors and it's all money and it's all negotiation that you and I have no idea what's going on, and um, it's all about money and yeah. and the power that goes with it, yeah. And so, I think it's really best framed thought of and spoken about in terms of corporates and money and business. Because if you throw the government out there as public enemy number one, that will tear away, as it is, at the foundations of our society. Yeah, We have to fix it. But we got to identify the problem correctly before you can hypothecate a situation to create solutions. Right. So we have to be careful about the language that we use. It is greed. Yeah. And and that's the number one enemy. It's the leadership. I'll tell you straight up, not just in martial arts, but in my world of Kembo, I have been so dismayed by those who are my seniors and therefore the leaders of Kembo who who don't apparently care at all about anything other than money and more students and acquiring what whatever. Right. If you if you take yourself and your selfish needs out of position number one and make the collective good, the common good, your objective number one, we could actually get somewhere. Right. I agree with you. Would you say we are, you know, capitalism has become a dirty word, but I like to say we're not capitalists anymore. You know, 1776 was capitalism. What we have today is corporatism, and that's where the government, or plutocracy, that's where the, uh, the government is controlled by a small group of corporations or an right. oligarchy disguised as a free market. Uh, that's what so I well. see. And so I, well said. Oh, thank you. Uh, but you, you're absolutely right. we got to get the language right. Like when we hear the word democracy, I cringe, because the word democracy appears in none of our founding documents. So... Um, uh, our founding fathers were actually petrified of a democracy. So I think you're right about service, uh, leadership. Um, how do we get a hold of you, Jeff, by the way? 
Uh, JeffSpeakman.com is a great way to go. And it will also show you the contact information for all the schools, not only around the country, but around the world. And it also has another link to our online academy. So if you don't live around a 5.0 school and you want to study, we now can take care of that for you. All of the 145 techniques, all of the sets and forms are all on a video system that are that is available to every single student around the world 24-7 on any device. And so not only will you learn at your dojo, but now you have the entire system in agonizing detail available to you through our Learn Worlds application. And that's not just to the school owners. That's to every single student starting at White Belt. That's awesome. Yeah, it's been I great. It. And by the way, folks, I suggest you get a training partner and do this, you know, because um, you, you can't learn throwing kicks in the air. You got to join. And I suggest you get involved in a dojo, maybe even start your own, because it's just we're in a different day and age than when I was growing up and Jeff was growing up. People are trained. You know, or they watch MMA and they go practice on their brothers, you know, or, the, um, you know, yeah. they watch the WWE and they take a chair against your head and think, oh, he'll survive. Um, people are nuts nowadays. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, sorry to use a medical term. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> uh, Jeff, you're, uh, thank you so much for being on Awakened Nation. And uh, we're about to go into the lightning round. I always ask three questions like, so they get to know you deeper, but. I am really honored that you said yes to be on the show today. Thank oh, you. thank you. Oh, it's the invitation uh, from you that was really great for me. Thank you. Uh, I always say this. There's two kinds of people that enter to the, jo the dojo for the first time. And that is the person enters, they get thrown to the ground, and they go, oh, no, 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 no. This is not for me. And then the second person who enters the dojo gets thrown to the ground, hops back up and says, how did you do that? Show me. Yeah, right. And I think that's a testament to not only the teacher that's there, because they're going to encourage that and support that. But if you get a, a teacher like Jeff, your kids are wanna, going to want to get trained uh, by a legend in the industry. Uh, and the adults I've met, you know, Dr. Jim Wright, he, uh, he was so uh, excited to get his black belt. I was really proud of him. Uh, and we had a lot of great conversations. So thank you, Jeff. Yes. And I'm so happy to hear your personal martial art experience was so much like mine <laughs> because we have become the people we become because we were fortunate enough to yeah. be trained by the kind of people that trained us. So I'm, yeah. I'm so happy for you Thank and you. for me. <laughs> I wish I had taken the martial arts earlier simply because of peace of mind, um, discipline, um, the core values that are there. And I'm a little bit of a traditionalist. So I like to iron my uniform and have all my patches mm -hmm. right. And I wear my belt a certain way. I have my yeah. name on my belt, you know. Um, those are the disciplines that I love and adore about the martial arts. And uh, thank you. Well thank said. Thank you for everything you do, man. Because uh, you do a quick Google search on you. You are serving all over the world, man. Love it. Thank you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask three questions, lightning round. You ready? You scared? Just a boiled ham. I'm always ready. <laughs> um, You're right out of Joplin, Missouri. There you go. My first question is: uh, You do the martial arts all the time, but is there anything else we need to know about you that you you just love to do? You do for fun? Um. <clears throat> well, uh, well, I do go to the gym every six days a week. Uh, and follow a, a rigorous bodybuilding kind of a, an approach to that. I've actually been doing that longer than I have been doing martial arts. So I'm 45 years into martial arts, 46 into weight training. Um, and that's something I really, truly love. I've decided to continue my education. So I'm currently a student at Purdue University Graduate School um, <clears throat> because the my undergraduate and hopefully soon graduate degree is in the behavioral sciences. And I've employed that structure to building this empire that I have right now. And I'm also beginning an alternate career of public speaking, motivational speaking, where I'm taking those principles of behavioral management 
and trying to show other businesses how I built what I built based on these concepts and principles of behavioral management. Um, so th those are things that are fun to me. Uh, they may be torture to other people, uh, but they're, <laughs> they, they give me a great deal of satisfaction. So those are the other things I do. You truly are the perfect weapon. <laughs> <laughs> All my friends call me perfect. It's all right. <laughs> and handsome too, right? Yeah. Uh, my second question is, um, do you have any regrets at all? I think there's certainly a way to answer that would be, of course, and I could name them, <clears throat> but I prefer not to think in that paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, I married my uh, my wife and I've been together 10 years, married five. And when we married, we went to one of the most incredible cathedrals in all of Europe in a place called Rhone, France, just outside of Paris. And um, and we invited all the school owners from around the world. I thought, you know, 15, 20, which 80 showed up people from Australia and New Zealand all over the U.S. It was amazing. Uh, the, the entire town was taken over by Tempo 5 people. <laughs> that was uh, fantastic. But anyway, um, at, at the reception afterwards, I said, the way I look at things is everything that happens in all of our lives, but speaking just about my life, is a precursor to what, you know, what you're going to do with it, where you're going to go, and what person are you going to become. It's not that trouble will or won't happen. It will suffering will be with all of us uh, as it is with me right now just the unexpected premature death of somebody i was very very close to in in the kempo world here in las vegas um and so we all face those things on a on a regular basis the question is not are you going to suffer are you going to fail the question is what are you going to do with it <clears throat> how will you overcome that override those limitations <clears throat> so in the reception of my wedding i said in that framework, I even have to appreciate the fact that I had stage four throat cancer because those momentous things that happened in my life previous to me meeting my wife uh, somehow were part of the equation that led me to be married to this incredible woman. And I'm, I'm very, very happy now. So I really can't look at even something as horrific as stage four cancer and call it a regret because it's part of the equation that led me to who I am today. Wow. I love your, your, the way you look at life, you know, because all those bad decisions turned out to be good decisions that yes. led to something better. I could, I could just imagine at your wedding, people coming in from Australia going, if Jeff Speakman asked me to be here, I'm going to be here. You know? <laughs> That's really good. That's <laughs> a really good accent. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the, the, when I interview Australians, it's hilarious. The F bomb comes out literally within 30 seconds. That's no, how kidding. Australians are. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm like, Holy crap. <laughs> exactly. Say crikey instead, please. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So my third and final question is yes. this, do you have a favorite memory? Mm. Take your time. I, I have many, <clears throat> um, but I would have to go to the magical days of being on the movie set of The Perfect Weapon. Not only was that momentous and, and a never done before, you know, get, uh, I studied acting five years before I did The Perfect Weapon. But aside from that, it appears to most everybody, I just walked off the street and got the job of the movie of The Perfect Weapon at Paramount, which, which is not the case. But uh, I was still that that fortunate but the real thing was not only was that um, amazing from any viewpoint but ed parker was alive then and with me and we knew what was going to happen we could see it um in the dailies you know in the in the stuff that you shot the day before there was even the big fight scene in the movie which is in the taekwondo gym yeah. uh, that was actually assembled we had a chance to look at it on this little monitor in my uh, trailer. Uh, no sound effects or anything. And Mr. Parker was sitting on the couch next to me. And when we watched that, he started bouncing up and down, clapping his hands, going, that's it, that's it. That, 
and I was getting knocked all over the place because I'm on the same couch with him. But he was so happy. Many people who knew him much, much longer than I said, the only time they saw him happier than the filming of The Perfect Weapon was for the birth of his children. Wow. And, and so I take a tremendous amount of satisfaction and pride for knowing that I gave this amazing man uh, who gave so much to all of us something back to him that was so meaningful and so uh, endearing to him. So that would have to be my favorite memories. It's as if you were his number one son uh, from his dojo, you know, and, and he was so proud of you. Yes. Um, and by the way, I recommend everybody go watch the, the perfect weapon because that fight scene is legendary because I think it was pretty realistic looking. That's what I liked about it. Um, love that movie. Watched it Thank to you. death. Thank you. <laughs> um, and even the opening scene where you're doing um, uh, pinions. Do they call opinions in Kempo? Uh, forms or katas. Yeah, yeah, katas. Yeah. Um, even that was in, I'm just like, wow, you know. Um, and I'm blessed to have taken the martial art Kempo uh, later in life. Just, you were an inspiration to that. I want to thank you once again for being on Awakened Nation, uh, Jeff. Thank you so much. I, I am indebted to you, sir. I, I really do appreciate so much. And if you ask, I'll be back anytime. You bet. I'll have you on next season as well. That'll be great. Great. Thank you. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to reach out to Jeff, jeffspeakman.com. Look all over for Kempo 5.0. Just Google it. Uh, he has plenty of YouTube videos. I love watching you train uh, and show the next generation how it's yeah. done. And uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, for tuning into this episode. See you next week and uh, bye bye till then. Thank you so much for being a big part of the Awakened Nation movement. This is how you can help me and our extraordinary guests. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let's grow this movement by word of mouth. Our success will be because of you. Thank you and see you next week. <laughs>